pleased to uh, introduce myself. I'm Miguel LeBlanc, the Executive Director of the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers. And I have the privilege, again, of uh, welcoming you all to the second series of three webinars organized by you, uh, by the Mural Mulqueen Ferguson Center of Family Violence Research in conjunction with the Canadian Association of Social Workers and the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers and the School of Social Work at St. Thomas University. The intent of this webinar is to provide social workers with an understanding of the effects of dominant rape and sex scripts in women's lives. Another objective is to introduce and consider feminist narrative practice, principles and strategies that can support women's efforts toward living well after experiences of sexual violence. It is one way for the CSW and the NBSW to celebrate the profession while providing opportunity to support and strengthen social work practice. Today, we are extremely fortunate to present two amazing guest speakers for this webinar, both of which I consider mentors uh, for my own work, Rena Arsenault and Sue McKenzie Moore. Rena Arsenault is a registered social worker with the New Brunswick uh, Association of Social Workers who was appointed in 2014 to the Order of Canada. Ms. Arsenault has been the Associate Director of the Miriam McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence since 1993. She is recognized as an activist and educator working to end family violence. The second uh, of my mentor is Sue McKenzie Moore, is the Associate Professor of the School of Social Work at St. Thomas University in Fredericton, Canada. Before accepting a faculty uh, position in 2003, Sue has been practicing social work for 15 years. Her scholarly interest includes women's experience of sexual violence, trauma, and youth homelessness youth experiences in the care system, and women's use of counter stories in response to oppressive conditions. Before I invite our guest speakers, I would like to welcome our moderator for today, Martin Paquet. Hello, uh, my name is Martin Paquet, and I'm the social work consultant of the New Brunswick Association of Social Workers. As a matter of housekeeping, I would like the participant to know uh, that the format of this webcast will be a 40 minutes a presentation uh, by Rina and Sue, following by a 20 minutes question period. This question and answer period will be moderated by Jenny Tornhill and myself. For our national audience uh, joining us today online, uh, during the presentation, you can type in and send in your question at any time. We will begin to ask questions from our live and online audience at the end of the presentation. Now, for the wait, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Rina Arsenault and Sue McKenzie Moore. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, and welcome to the Wanderer here with us in New Brunswick. And we have beautiful weather like usual. Now, I'm going to ask the one online are you still having problem hearing us? If you would check. Maybe check your own settings. It could be something wrong with your settings because others are hearing us very well. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for coming. It is my great pleasure being here again for the second webinar. And uh, before I forget, I'll uh, remind you right now, the third webinar is also coming up March 27th. And that one is really dear to my heart because we're going to be speaking about us as social workers and how can we nurture ourselves, how can we nurture ourselves when we're dealing with so many, so many issues uh, and how can we stay resilient. So that will be a very interesting one, so I'm welcoming you all to that one. But today we have a two, at least two learning objectives and I guess I should do my own clicking here. Uh, one is to explore the effect of dominant rape and sex scripts in women's lives, and and how that has an you know it has an impact on us as responders. So we need to also explore that and to introduce and consider feminist narrative practice principles and strategy that can support women's effort towards living well after experiencing experiencing sexual violence. So it's just going to be a taste. It's 40 minutes, but I hope that we'll give you enough that it will want you to go and try to get more information. So the agenda for today will be looking at narratives surrounding sex and sexual violence, particular challenges, uh, I guess I should put my glasses on, that's why I brought them, 
particular challenges during intimate, part, intimate sexual violence, the role of allies supporting women in narrative repair, which is counter-storying experiences of sexual violence, so looking always at our own language, and then the discussion period. So over to me. It is to you. Thank you. And then I'm going to steal that as well. Welcome, and I'm Sue. Sexual violence is a complex issue, and today we could focus in on a number of areas, such as safety planning, accessing helpful referrals, working through varied effects of sexual violence. But in this hour, Rena and I, as she said, are going to focus in on one central issue, that of finding language, ways to frame the experience of sexual violence, and particularly the experience of intimate partner sexual violence. And I just want to do a check before I keep rolling. Am, are you hearing that it's working well, my voice? Hold it up. OK. My father was a principal. I've got a good principal voice in my family line. Because without a helpful framing of a woman's experience, she and others are blocked in their attempts to adequately make meaning of the experience and find helpful ways to move forward. Let's for a minute step back, though, from the issue of sexual violence and talk about how we make meaning of our experiences. Yes? I will. And I'll figure out how to make it. I think. OK, now try it. There we go. Maybe I'll just hold. Is that OK? Is this close? Is this close? OK. OK, good. I will just keep it here. We make meaning of our lives through our stories. Our stories shape our identities and guide us in how to move forward in our lives. But these stories that we develop do not appear out of thin air. Instead, we draw upon language and narrative framings that are available to us in our society in order to assist us in storying our lives. Now here's the thing. While some narratives remain marginalized in society, attaining only limited influence, Others achieve what Arthur Frank describes as master status. They've been taken up broadly in society and thus wield significant influence. With such power, these master narratives are afforded the ability to directly influence both how lives should be lived and also how blame and merit should be allocated. These master narratives are typically drawn upon without us even noticing. They are simply taken up as common sense. And so we're often unaware of their influence as we make sense of ours and others' experiences. Now, when the consequences of this is benign, when our identities and prospects are not hurt by these master narratives, it isn't highly concerning and may even be beneficial. However, when the master narratives that float about in a culture have harmful consequences, as is true when it comes to women's experiences of sexual violence, our need to recognize and resist these harmful master framings is absolutely crucial. Ken Plummer poses important questions about the narratives surrounding women's experiences of sexual violence. He writes, what allows a rape story to be told, to be felt, to be heard, to be legitimated? When can a woman who has been raped give public voice to it? And indeed, to which public will she voice it? Her partner, her child, her parent, the police, the media, the court, a rape hotline, the defendant? When will it be a credible voice, and when will it be an incredible one? The answer to these questions are strongly influenced by the master narratives of sex and sexual violence in any given culture. In the West, what I call the negate or blame narrative has maintained master status to explain women's experiences of sexual violence in many parts of society since the early 1800s. Although the trauma of rape narrative has been advanced by feminist activists and practitioners since the 1970s to directly resist the claims of the neg negate or blame <laughs> the negate or blame narrative and has gained significant and broad uptake, the negate or blame narrative has maintained a powerful hold over societal framings of women's sexual violence experiences. In a nutshell, the negator blame narrative constructs sexual violence 
as either within the typical parameters of sex between a man and a woman, it's just sex, thus negating it as problematic, or the woman is blamed for a myriad of reasons for having been raped. Within this negate or blame narrative, the only rape claims to be offered legitimacy involve highly restrictive conditions, which Wood and Rennie first coined the Hollywood rape. And so here is what we're offered. A woman's rape is more likely to be recognized as real and not her fault when she is young, white, able-bodied, and is assessed as having behaved in a way that is beyond reproach, in other words, sober, wearing modest attire, the rapist is identified as a delinquent male, often racialized stranger. There's evidence of severe physical violence and obvious efforts by the woman to fight back. And she proceeds immediately to the authorities after the attack, presenting as highly distraught. But when these criteria are not fully met, in, frequently in society, the negate or blame narrative is invoked. And a woman must face her experience of sexual violence being framed as just sex, normalizing men's active pursuit of sex and women's resistance as an expected part of foreplay. Or she is blamed, judged as reckless, having failed in her role as gatekeeper of sex. Some have suggested that social progress has lessened these harmful messages and argue that we are no longer a rape support of culture, that feminist activists can put down their placards and head home. But unfortunately, these arguments tend not to be borne out in the research. As just one example, the findings of the Amnesty International Sexual Assault Survey completed in the UK in 2005, which involved about 1,100 participants, are indeed sobering. About a quarter of respondents believed that a woman is partially or totally responsible for being assaulted if she was in a deserted location, if she has had many sexual partners, or if she was wearing revealing clothing at the time of the assault. And about a third of respondents believed that a woman was partially or totally responsible for being assaulted if she was drunk at the time of the rape, or if she hadn't said no clearly enough. Unquestionably, blaming women for having been assaulted remains commonplace. And when women are not blamed, their experiences are frequently negated. How does this happen? Well, our dominant narratives of sex and sexual violence are grossly intertwined in Western society, so that women's resistance behavior is represented as part of the heterosexual game of courtship and mating. The man is to be active and even aggressive in his pursuit, and the woman is to be coy and resistant, needing to be convinced. And so coercing, taking advantage, tricking, and even dominating women is normalized. Some examples from various forms of media clearly make this point. Consider these direct condom ads of 2008. In the ad on the subway turnstiles, we read, there are better things to hit. Who is invited to smack their pelvises against these turnstiles? And on the right, does the ad for extra large condoms normalize that women are expected to take a man's penis fully into her mouth despite it ripping her? Drink names also reflect the normalcy of the strategy of taking advantage of a woman. Numerous drinks found on the internet have been given the name liquid panty remover. Men shown in ads with women are very often powerful and dominating. The risk of violence seems real. Both have weapons exposed. And we aren't sure, are the women frightened, hurt, aroused, or do they experience all of these reactions? And remember, this ad is for women's clothing. It is targeting women viewers with this image. Current popular and highly acclaimed TV shows present a similar dynamic in their ads. Is the woman hurt, frightened, threatened? And is she liking it? Is she an accomplice? Notice the messages, king takes queen, but in this game, it hurts so good. Blurred Lines, one of the top-selling singles of 2013, had many people singing along to the boppy tune. I hate these blurred lines. I know you want it. I'll give you something big enough to tear your ass into. Swag on, even when you dress casual. I mean, it's almost unbearable. And in the 2008 ad, MTV uses Jessica Alba's 
naked bondage. To astounding as this may seem, encourage young adults to register to vote. And again, notice the message where she is clearly to blame for being in this position. Only you can silence yourself. When these messages of male domination are normalized and sexualized all around us, how do individuals distinguish between what is sexual violence and what is just sex? And remember, these images are meant to be glanced at casually as we flip through a magazine or to be sung along to, not to be reacted to with any distress or outrage. The portrayal of sexualized violence as mundane, as entertainment, as normal, as just sex, or as a woman's fault, has significant repercussions for women. How are we expected to understand or make sense of a rape experience when violence and power over women has been woven so deftly into the dominant narratives of sex? As Rena will now explore, this can be a particular challenging task for women who are experiencing violence in the context of ongoing intimate relationships. Thank you, Sue. Ah, oh, 2015, eh? It just makes you wonder sometimes. And now if we looked at all of this through an intimate partner violence lens, what does it mean? And it certainly adds to what we are seeing. First of all, how do we define it? You know, we're looking at addressing all forms all forms of sexual assault that occur with a current or a past intimate relationship, whether the partners are married or not. It may occur with or without the presence of other physical violence. You know, I'm not saying that there's no violence. We can talk about emotional violence, verbal violence. But it could be without physical violence during the act or within the relationship. It involves a sexual act without consent, not because you are in a relationship are you consenting to everything in a relationship. And may involve controlling through fear, threats, coercion, manipulation, or violence. May not be identified by the woman as sexual violence. It's very difficult to define what you're living at a time you're living it if you are in an intimate relationship. And we'll explore that a little better in a few slides with some, some testimonial. May involve individual and same-sex relationships and those of all age from tweens on up. Has often been overlooked by the public, by law enforcement, and by us service providers. Rape within marriage was not illegal in Canada in, until 1983. It is only with Bill C-127 that we change this language and we change the fact that wives could now charge their husband for, for sexual assault. We also changed the language at that time. And I won't talk too much about that, but you, you've got to remember there was a different language before 1983. We talked about rape. We didn't talk about sexual assault. Intimate partner sexual violence continues to be minimized. What are the occurrence of intimate partner sexual violence? Approximately 10 to 14 percent of married and cohabitating women have experienced rape by their partners. 37 percent of women responded in a study had experienced some form of sexual violence by a husband or male intimate partner. 16 to 19 years old females are four times more likely than the general public to report sexual assault, excuse me, sexual assault. And the perpetrator is often an intimate partner. 16 to 19, very vulnerable age. When men are physically violent towards their partner, the percentage of women experiencing rape at their end rise to 40%. Intimate partner violence is often as if not more, violent than assault by strangers, particularly when other form of violence is present in the relationship. 
You know, IPSV creates a highly dangerous situation and is associated with, with increased risk of death, severe long-term trauma for victims, physical and psychological harm to children, and repeated victimization. From teens in abusive dating relationships to adult with long-term partners who use sex as a weapon of power and control, survivors of IPSV often feel isolated and misunderstood by the very professionals to whom they turn for help. Because IPSV involves both intimate partner violence and sexual assault, victim needs may not be fully addressed by services focusing on one or the other. Examples of what we're speaking about. Using a woman financially dependent, dependency, financial dependency to coerce her to engage in unwanted sexual act. Experiencing degrading name calling of a sexual nature. A same-sex partner is trying to out the individual if she refused or he refused to participate in a sex act. Rape to intentionally impregnate a partner in order to coerce her to remain in a relationship or to return to the relationship. Forced participation in group sex, sex with another person, making or watching pornography, forced prostitution. And I must say that during my 11 years working in a shelter, what happened behind the master's bedroom could really be unbelievable. And I've heard so many stories of so many women that never dared say anything because we had such a hard time to talk about sex. A college student threatened to post naked photos of his girlfriend on the internet if she won't have sex with him. Harassing a partner to participate in a sex in the midst of jealous accusation that she has been unfaithful. Going along with sex due to fear of repercussion if she refuses. I don't know about you, but it would be very difficult for me to refuse having sex at night if I was beaten that morning. And to think of ways that women have come up to try to alleviate some of these pressures. I've heard of women keeping their panties on, thinking that that would be a barrier to tell him, you know, I really don't want to do it tonight. But that was not part of the relationship. There was no no accepted. Many a woman has told her partner she doesn't like to perform oral sex because it reminds her of childhood sexual abuse. But he insists that she must do this or you will seek sexual satisfaction elsewhere. Force oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse also forced to use all type of object during sex. Unwanting sexual touching. For example, a husband angry has physically hurt his wife by pushing or hitting her. She's still angry with, her, with him because it just happened. And he comes up while she's cooking supper and puts his hand on her breast. Unwanted. But will she say no? Some of the testimonials that, been, that I've heard, only a few. I belong to my husband. He always said you're married to me. Now I own you. Sometimes he would insist for me to do things that I did not really want to do. But I had no choice in the matter. This one, this one quote I really love because it's got it all. It also has how difficult it is to talk about this matter. My ex-husband would get very frustrated and if I was backing out of sex or not interested, you know, there was a lot of pressure. And then if I was trying to back out and I was not comfortable, there would just be, he would just keep going. So essentially, I was raped many times during my relationship. Now you see by these words how difficult it is to put the finger, how to define this. Mm, but it does get blurry in that context. Because sometimes it was something that I was interested in. But then mm, sometimes something would spark something that would either stress me, 
stress me out from a previous experience, or he would get angry about something, or he would be drunk, and because of that sometime, there would be violence or head gains, and emotional violence, that would tie it all together. So it's so difficult eh, to get in the moment, even though you're in a relationship with someone, there's a part of you that is still wanting sex, but then, maybe as soon as it's instigated, you remember, oh, he does something, and it reminds you of the last time, and all of a sudden, it's not okay anymore. And she goes on. So it might be the actual physical intimidation that might not be traditional. Okay, sometimes it's just taken me as much as being talking to something I'm not comfortable with. But knowing the potential consequences could be. And so that didn't start until after we were married. Of course, because that got the contract signed. Hmm. It was something that then that, of course, I never did want to have sex. So the amount of times, I have no clue. So actually, looking back at a relationship, she cannot really tell anymore if she really have ever wanted it. Because it was always colored by something. So what are some of the common re re reactions to IPSB? Certainly confusion. You know, I just, I just don't like it, but I don't understand why. Shame, guilt. What have I done to cause this? What did I do that I'm dirty? Denial. It really didn't happen. You know, and the next day you'd say, well, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad. You know, hey, I'm in a relationship. So you have to minimize in order to be able to keep on going. Rationalization. He didn't mean to. I must have teased him. So taking the blame. Because in most relationships, in most intimate partner violence relationships, the beginning of the relationship really sends you messages that you are at fault somehow. So you take the blame for other things too, such as unwanted sex. What is wrong with me? And am I frigid? Is that my problem? What is wrong that I don't want to have sex with my, with my husband? Flatten effect. I feel so numb. I can't fight anymore. And fear. And focus on coping. I'll just sleep with the kids tonight. So not looking at the situation, because I can't take care of this. So I'll just try to find other ways. So sleeping with the kids, sleeping on the sofa. You know, some will get pretty drunk to just try to get through another night. So if we look again at Madeline, when Madeline finally was leaving an abusive husband, she returned with a friend to get some of her things and her cat. Her cat was very important to her. And earlier that day, her partner had taken her cat outside and the cat had ran away. But when Madeline came to the apartment, her partner was highly agitated and was attempting to force her to talk. So the friend, seeing this scenario, called the police. And here's what happened. Their initial response to me when I said, you know, this guy has been abusive. I was like, listen, this guy has beat me. He's raped me. I don't know what, what, what he's doing. He's stolen my cat. He's threatened to throw my shit out. And I'm on lease here. I, I have every right to be here. And your first initial thing was, well, why didn't you call us before when he was beating you and raping you? And I was, yeah, because I was scared that you react like that. So again, Madeline is internalizing the blame. And now, back for my call. Still some challenges with hearing. Is this good? Yeah. Good. So now let's talk a bit about how we can be allies to women who are in these experiences. A first critical step for women in being able to frame the experiences of sexual violence in a helpful way 
involves simply naming their experience. Women with whom I have worked, particularly those who were in relationships with their assailant, initially describe their sexual violence experience in varied ways, as sex, as sex that confused her, as sex that made her feel nauseated, as sex that she didn't like or want, as sex that was wrong, as sex that made her feel ashamed, or simply as bad sex. But for most, rape and sexual assault were not the terms initially used. Because women frequently are not naming experiences that would, by definition, qualify as rape or assault, as allies, we mustn't be expecting to hear these terms when meeting with a woman and attempting to understand her needs. Let me offer an example from a research interview that I conducted with a woman about her attempts to access services while she was experiencing sexual violence at the hands of an abusive partner. This experience with a healthcare professional occurred very early on in her relationship after he first raped her and she feared becoming pregnant. At 18 years old, Olivia went alone to the sexual health clinic to ask if she could get plan B. In her words, I was still very much so in shock and disbelief and denial. And so basically, I went there and then I explained that I was there to get the plan B. And they were like, they asked me if I had ever had sex before. And I think they asked, was it rape? There were these kinds of questions. And I just remember feeling interrogated. And like, as soon as I said no to the rape, because again, I was still, I was very in denial. But as soon as I answered those questions, it became very judgmental of like, well, you didn't use protection, or, oh, you don't know if he has pe past sex partners? It was very like, how could you be so stupid? Like, that's how I felt by the person that was dealing with the situation. I felt very much so like, you have failed, you messed up, and you aren't being smart. And I was like, OK. I didn't tell anybody, not friends, not family, not anyone. Highlighted here. We can see the serious potential consequences involved when our questions to assess a woman's experience assume a straightforward understanding and naming of that experience. Careful questions that do not assume that a woman will label her experience of sexual violence as rape or assault or as sexual violence can be highly valuable and a crucial first step in a woman counterstorying her experience. Social worker Kathleen Arledge offers helpful examples of screening questions for intimate partner sexual violence, highlighting that the tone and the language we use to explore women's experiences is paramount. She highlights questions such as, have you ever been intimate with your partner when you didn't want to? Have you ever been intimate with your partner because you were afraid of him or her? Are there times when sex between you and your partner is unpleasant for either one of you? What happens to make it unpleasant? Do you and your partner ever have disagreements about sex? For example, when and how often to have sex, or what sex acts to engage in? How do you resolve these disagreements? Have you ever given in to a sexual encounter with your partner to avoid fighting or being hurt? These carefully languaged explorations can be a crucial first step. But once a woman has named her experience as a form of sexual violence, she may then be facing the harmful consequences, again, of that negate or blame narrative. We blatantly heard this in Madeline's quote that Rena shared. When she called the police, she had come to a point in her life when she was now naming her experience with her violent husband as rape. And yet the police officer's first response was a blaming one. Well. Why didn't you call us before when he was beating and raping you? Given these social realities, women's self-blame, as we know, is a common occurrence. Feminist narrative practice offers a valuable means by which women can counter-story their experiences of sexual violence. In this practice, women are offered the space and support to resist harmful stories of their sexual violence that they may have internalized, given our harmful master narratives. They can examine, unsettle, challenge, and thus deconstruct these stories of sexual violence. And women are then able to take time to reconstruct useful alternatives to counter-story their experiences. 
Hilda Lindemann Nelson has described this type of work as narrative repair. She asserts that because identities are narratively constituted and can be narratively injured, they can also be narratively repaired. This involves first challenging the assertions of harmful master narratives and then creating and thickening up helpful counter stories. The master narrative and the counter story are incompatible. Thus, a counter story targets an oppressive master narrative and sets out to repair the damage that has been inflicted. Given that more helpful narratives of sexual violence, though, are often not readily available, metaphors can be helpful in this work. Let me share one example from my practice to highlight the use of metaphor as a young woman, Gail, works to deconstruct and reconstruct her storied experience of her options with an abusive partner. At the time I was working with Gail, she was no longer living with her partner, who had been both physically and sexually violent toward her. We'd been working together for two months, and during that time, Gail had begun to name his violence and unsettled the belief that she had somehow deserved or asked for his violent attacks. However, one day she came to meet with me and announced that she would be returning to live with him. I was deeply troubled. Her partner was highly controlling and violent. She'd been hospitalized with injuries in the past. But in her words, he had summoned her, and she feared that she would face awful consequences if she did not comply with this demand. In Gail's words, he calls the shots, they're his rules, it's his game, and we're all just pawns on his game board. This seemed a powerful metaphor that Gail used. And I wondered whether we might be able to find ways to counterstory her sense of powerlessness and lack of ownership over her life by using it. So I asked her about this game and if it had a name. Without missing a beat, she said, the game is called power. I asked her more about the game to try to understand what she was up against. I asked, what is the goal of this game? It was for her partner to have as much money and power as he could and for everyone else to do as he says. I asked, how does one win? She said, only her partner is allowed to win. She is merely his pawn. And I asked, so what are the rules of play? Gail explained that they focus only on the needs of one player, while the rest of the players can be hurt for no reason. This questioning within her metaphor allowed Gail to share with me what she was up against in the challenges of her life. And this brought me to considering how to begin to counter story, to build a preferred story with Gail using this metaphor. I wanted to explore what Gail held as precious and how she had resisted in spite of the violence. We began these explorations together as I asked Gail, what do your reactions to your partner's game speak to in terms of important beliefs about life for you that have been violated? And I asked, when you're ready to build your own game board upon which you want to live your life, what title, what goals, what rules will you choose? As we lingered in this counter story, Gail named her game Freedom and Respect. And her first established rule was that there can be more than one winner. I also wanted to learn and support Gail in recognizing any times and ways that she may already have been living out this counter story. I asked, for example, have there been any times when you have resisted the rules of your partner's game board and lived more by your own rules, even just a little? After some consideration, Gail recognized that her moving out two months ago was a bold move onto her own game board, which allowed us to discuss how she managed to do this and how she might find means to carry on with this path rather than returning to live with her partner and the dangerous rules of his game of power. Gail did not, in the end, return to live with her partner. She continued over the next several months to work to establish herself, living on her own game board by rules that were meaningful to her, and she used this metaphor regularly as she met with me during that time. Beyond our work to support women in counter-storing their experiences of sexual violence at a personal level, as allies and social workers, we're also called to engage in collective efforts to change oppressive master narratives, strategizing to resist oppressive framings and promote counter-stories of sexual violence and of sex. 
vital contributions over the past four decades have been spearheaded by feminist activists to both challenge dominant rape myths through public education efforts and bring about systemic reform within the criminal justice system. But to dismantle rape supportive culture, we need to target and replace oppressive master narratives by broadening and intensifying current education efforts. We require, we require greater programming with younger students at elementary, middle, and high school levels. And in these efforts, we must disrupt the normative sex scripts and dominant conceptions of masculinity and femininity. This is no small, I know you get, undertaking. It involves challenging heteronormativity and transforming the nature of sexual relationships between men and women. And we need to get behind. Thank you. And we need to get behind strategies to support adolescent boys and men's development into effective allies in these dismantling efforts as we chip away at society's acceptance of aggressive masculinity. Men Can Stop Rape, Creating Cultures Free from Violence is an organization based in the United States that offers one such example. Staff members run programs that aim to change what society is teaching boys and young men about strong masculinity. In their Men of Strength clubs, which are facilitated groups of adolescent boys and young men in public schools and colleges, they explore and trouble the master narrative of masculinity, discuss dangerous implications of this narrative for women's sexual safety, counter story a new vision of healthy masculinity, and together act on this new narrative through social change efforts to end sexual violence against women. Educational counter storing efforts such as these deserve our attention and our support. And I'm going to turn this over for the final word. Tarina. Sorry, I forgot to turn it back on. So really, we tried very hard to just kind of put it in 40 minutes a bit of the issues that we'll be encountering today, looking more at what a societal point of view when we come to sexual violence, and then bring it a little bit more closer to home. And I, I think now that we're ready to try to entertain some of the questions, some of the comments that you may have, me either in on the chat line or here in the, uh, in the classroom. But certainly for me, whenever we do these type of presentation, it just reminds me on a constant basis that we have come a long way, but that we still have some long ways to go, looking at still the stories that we hear and the stories that's being built, the, what our clients are telling us and what the clients are not telling us because they don't think we're there for them. So uh, we, we won't believe them. Or that somehow their story doesn't, is so out there that there's no way that they can find words to explain it. So uh, I think Sue and I are now ready for question, comments. Any question, comments from the, the class or from microphone, please? Yes. <laughs> we have some people typing, I see. Any question? Yes, I'll repeat. So uh, Michelle's question is, uh, if, and you let me know if I, if you want me to adjust this. But what I understand is you're saying that some of the focus that we gave to being allies at a more personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with, with women uh, you found helpful, but you feel a little overwhelmed by the both the importance and the challenge of thinking about how we dismantle those really harmful master narratives. 
that is the $24 million question in my mind. Um, I think it's, but I think we have to be grappling with it. Um, one of the reasons that I showed the example I did at the end about men becoming allies is I absolutely believe that we need to be at a place where we're all working on this together, that this isn't a woman's issue. Um, and I know that, that there are many efforts going on where men are stepping forward and really wanting to be active allies, not running their own show or saying how it should be done, but really wanting to collaborate with women who are involved in this area and really work in valuable ways together. I think that's key. I think we need to be dismantling um, those ideas about sex, masculinity, femininity, sexual violence at younger ages so that our kids are hearing things at school in other places and then going home and bringing that into their homes. Um, I know that there are people doing that. Emily's here and I know that Emily is out now as part of the Fredericton Sexual Assault Crisis Center going out. She and a retired male principal go out as a team. So having a young woman in her early 20s and um, a retired male um, principal heading out and going to most of our middle schools in the region who are talking about these issues and really creating a safe space with people who are not the teachers so that students don't have this sense of, can I ask this question? Um, they get to put their questions in a box and what they've been guaranteed is that every question will be answered. They have people coming up to them afterwards, you know, 12, 13 year olds coming up to try to work through what they've experienced already in their lives that has troubled them and trying to, to name it and make sense of it. So those are some of my initial thoughts. So I don't know if others have, or Rena. Yes, uh, Patty is asking, what do, we, what do we do to have the legal system address rapes? I work in a court system and see that sex assault charges are not going forward. Rapists are not being charged. What? So I would say, what, what are we going to do about this? Um, what has to happen for this, to, for this change to happen? Well, I think it's, it just joins back what Sue is saying. We need to change the culture, the way that we look at it. You know, uh, we need to certainly have more training for police officers, for judges, for crown prosecutors. We still continue to train and use our professional development in order for people to understand the complexities of the issues. Certainly that needs to happen. But we also need to understand it. And we also need to stand behind them. Because it's very difficult as a rape victim to still, at the same time, try to change the structure it is easier for us to try to help to change the way that people view sexual violence and sexual assault. Anything to add to? No, the, only, the only other thing I would say is that, um, that, just piggybacks on that, is I would agree, and our research has shown us, that uh, the court system tends to very much follow that negate or blame narrative. That if we're really, if, if we have, um, sexual assault cases coming forward, the best chance of those going forward are for them to fit into, if you remember the Hollywood rape scenario, then maybe you've got a shot. But outside of that, it gets much, much more challenging. And I know that the bind that many allies can be in is that place of how much do we caution a woman about stepping forward into the possibilities of being re-victimized by going forward to the courts. So we know we're in this double bind because we know we have very small numbers of women who are going forward, particularly when they are in intimate relationships with the assailants, um, but across the board. And then, uh, but they can't hear. Now, can you hear? You can hear? OK. But that. Um, but that even when um, women are going, oh, sorry. So saying that on the one hand, they're not going forward, but I caution the idea of sending women and encouraging women to use the court systems if they are going to have that kind of negative response. 
where they're, they're feeling that they've been put on trial. Really problematic. Yeah. Another comment uh, uh, from another person, Janet, is asking, what about alternative forms of justice? And I do agree that we have different type of form of, of uh, justice that we could use. But I think, the, I always put that and into ourselves as professionals, we must begin by believing. We must, if we are there and believe and support, they may have more strength. And if we are there to support all through whatever justice system we decide to use, may it be the restorative or may it be that she's not ready for it, whatever she decides, that we are on the same path with her. I think that, just in that, can help her own emotional repair. And we need to also look at that. I mean, that is primary, to look at our own. And even if we can, when we talk to other professionals, such as police officers, such a judge, a crime prosecutor, if we are doing training, if we are doing professional development, they are, we always bring that forward, that we need to believe and be there and be supportive, whatever the road, whatever the path that's being chosen. Can I just add to that and say that to be honest, I'm not hopeful that the court system is going to be at the forefront of us changing uh, this process and, and how adequately they respond to women's experiences of sexual violence. But what I do hold on to is that I believe that as we do that work, as we really work to change those master narratives, that it will bring the court system along. Not an, not an ideal response, but. Other question, comments? None on, oh, there's somebody, I think, oh. Presenter's opinion regarding Hollywood endorse IPSV, such as the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise. How do we counter this very strong story? Hmm, interesting. Huh? And that's just one of many. I mean, we have an entire, I, I don't know what's happening. There is a, an entire seem to be, well, itself, itself. And unfortunately, we are always facing the big conglomerate, conglomerate that makes money. And certainly, these does. Uh, I guess one of the things, you know, we all have choices. We all have voices. And maybe in a small way, but it's still there. We can use those voices and we can use those choices. And so if as choice, I do not go see Fifty Shade, I don't read Fifty Shade, and I tell my friends I don't, that is certainly one way. It's a very minimal, but it's still certainly a step forward. Um, but how do we then change that narrative? I mean, how about if we write that best sellout story? You know, there is other ways also that we could empower women, women writers, to write the realities of women's lives. Believe me, I'd go see it. I'd buy it. And so these are some of the things, some ways that we can kind of also balance this kind of, of ways that, that is happening right now. Maybe I'll say, too, I... I did read the books. I read all three of the books. And the reason I read them is because I was having people when I was out in forums like this or my students asking me questions about it. And so I thought, how can I have a strong opinion without reading it? And so I did. And part of what intrigued me, if I'm just using my cognitive self, part of what intrigued me was that it was such a huge seller and that it was predominantly to women. And I wanted to try to understand what is the draw. I mean, it's titillating, right? It is. There's no question. But I think part of that, I kept thinking, this is a Beauty and the Beast story. I don't know how many of you have read it, but it is that kind of, if a woman just loves the beast enough, if she just moves along, it can be this romantic, beautiful ending. It's like Beauty and the Beast for 2015, you know, you know in a warped sort of way for me. And I think part of what I worry about, though, is that it has shifted what we understand even more so when we talk about what's within the normal range of typical sex. 
and I worry about how it's going to be used against women. I have heard different women talk in research interviews I've done who have said to me, well, I was just told my, by my partner, it's supposed to hurt. You're supposed to cry. This is part of normal sex. And for me, books like this just give more fuel that fire, that kind of message that women, if they aren't OK with a little BDSM or you know, if they're not going to move in that direction, there's, I mean, we've got lots of language for women who don't do the things that men want them to do sexually. And here's some more things that if you're not willing to do it, if you're hesitant, you might be, what are you, frigid, you know, and the kind of languaging that goes on for women who want to say no, they're not comfortable with certain actions. And that's not to say that I don't think that some women and men in consenting relationships can choose to have a variety of ways of enjoying sex, but I worry that this has normalized it so much that it's making it very difficult for women to say no to that. Exactly. Uh, there is another uh, question. Uh, which country in the world deals with rape victims in the best and timely way? Good question. I think maybe I moved there. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Because even the best that we've heard of, um, there's always an undercurrent. So we only hear the public ways of dealing and not because I've le always heard the two ways. If I go, and when I went to Stockholm, and I really had, I, I know they have a wonderful way of dealing, especially with prostitutes and all that. But when I, I asked the service providers, they didn't paint the same picture that I had been painted living here in Canada, which was very different. So I really don't know. I think it would be a good question to ask. And I will certainly try to explore it. If I ever get to an answer, I'll, uh, I'll make sure that I'll publicize it. Um, certainly, that is, you know, we've only tentatively started talking about this issue. This is, uh, this is a huge issue that we need to talk about more and more and more so that we ourselves find the words and the arguments, so that we ourselves are able to find the ways that we can move forward. Because it's only in small ways that we now start talking about it. And so we can't find the answers today. But if we have more of these kind of discussion, then I'm sure that we'll find the arguments. I'm sure that we'll find a path that we can all follow. And I just want to give a big thank you to everybody here in, at St. Thomas and also those who are joining us. Um, uh, on the internet, just a big thank you for joining us today. And then I'm going to hand it over to Martin. Uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, I just want to mention that the link for today's PowerPoint presentation, as well as the link for uh, the webinar, will be uh, uploaded on the CSW website, as well as the New Brunswick Association of Social Worker website. Uh, I would also like to take this time uh, to acknowledge Rena and Sue uh, for lending their time and experience to this uh, event and for their ongoing contribu contribution to supporting and promoting our profession as well. Uh, thank you again, and we look forward to be with you at their, at their third uh, webinar, which will be held on March 27 uh, at uh, 12. Thank you very much.